Welcome back to the Church Front Show, where we're going to be covering all of the latest news in the worship and production world. And we've got some exciting things we're going to talk about today. Uh, pro tips when it comes to mixing in ear monitors for your vocalists and worship leaders. We're going to talk about using AI for your LED wall content um, or even projection content. We're going to talk about new gear from Waves. Uh, some new uh, software that we came across that might allow you to remotely rehearse with your worship band, uh, and much, much more. You're just going to have to watch this episode, listen to it to the end, uh, to hear about all the cool new tools that we are going to cover. So up first, guys, I came across this really interesting thread here in Facebook. Uh, it was initiated by uh, the, the one and only Jesse O'Brien, mix engineer at Red Rocks Church, and he asks, monitor mixing baffles me. All I want to do is fix everyone's self-indulging in-ear monitor mix. I've also never been on stage with a mix I need to function with. Any tricks, things y'all do to help the worship leaders and their ears? Um, so this is a great question, and I, I think there are, you know, a lot of us uh, in, in the church front community are probably only doing mixing or only doing worship leading. And there's not a lot of overlap uh, in those two worlds, right? So I, I have a few thoughts I'd like to share on this. And I want to go through the comments here of some, some great tips that people shared. Because as a sound engineer, you, you really have to kind of put yourself in the shoes of a vocalist, a lead, worship, a worship leader, and understand like what do they actually need and why and how does that translate to the mixing console. Um, so let's read a couple of these and then we'll kind of jam on some of these ideas here. Uh, the one and only uh, James Attaway. There's so much gold in this uh, Facebook uh, group here. This is a church sound and media text. It's almost as good as the church front group, right? Guys? Almost. Almost. <laughs> almost. The uh, James Attaway. A great performance can be boiled down to three elements, pitch, pulse, and passion. I like, I like the, the alliteration there. So their monitor mix needs to help them do that by answering three questions. Where's the beat and rhythm? Where's the center of the pitch? And where are the dynamics now? And where are they going? So when I'm training musicians and singers, they're either new in your monitors or they've been at it at a while. I have to then try starting over and clearing uh, the mix. Uh, so he kind of helps them rebuild their mix. So put both ears in. That's, that's an important tip and use crowd mics this helps them stay feeling connected to the room and less likely to pull out one ear in your monitor uh turn up the primary instrument the instrument that's leading the song till it's comfortable then maybe turn it down a tiny bit from there add the worship leader's vocal so it matches the primary instrument don't go crazy here add the bass guitar till it matches the primary instrument basically adding uh, the lower octave add the kick drum so it matches the bass guitar then air add the snare to match the kick uh then a tiny bit of overheads now they can add themselves. Make sure they're hearing their instrument in context. It doesn't have to be way, way in front of everything else. Add other instruments in by panning them and keeping them low. The detail that comes from in-ear monitors lets you identify so many things at low levels. Uh, and he's got plenty of other great videos on this on his YouTube channel. That last tip, I will say, I want to emphasize that is the importance of having a stereo mix for your in-ear monitors is going to dramatically help your musicians. And like he said, panning them allows you to like run something at a much lower level, but because you can put it in space within their stereo field, it's just easy for them to pick it out. Whereas when you mash everything together in a mono mix, um, you feel like you have to make everything loud and then they start crowding each other out and it's really hard to hear. So I'm saying that as both a mix engineer and a worship leader, when I'm dialing in my mix, I'm, I'm leading worship about once a month, once every other month. So that experience is, is fresh in my mind. Uh, Jacob Hanan, Hanan, Hanan. <laughs> One of those uh, I have learned they only need a couple of things, a pitch reference uh, and time reference, uh, similar to what um, uh, James was talking about. As a monitor engineer, I spend a lot of time listening to mixes and uh, learning who likes what. And after a couple of weeks, uh, the team starts trusting me to adjust their ears to sound like they what they want. So Jacob's talking about in some places, if you have a large enough team, you can have a dedicated monitor engineer who's in charge of these mixes, uh, which is really nice. Um, next one from Ryan, uh, tempo, pitch, and themselves. That's what they need. Um, less is more from Chris. You don't have to have everything 
in your ears, zero them out and rebuild the mix. That's another common thing I encourage people to do, you know, whether they're working with like a P16 uh, digital mixer or their in-ears, uh, a common thing I see too is like, I go over to their P16 and like all the channels are like blasting loud. And then the master fader, a master knob on the P16 is at like a quarter of the way up. So it's yeah. like, they're not, they're not giving themselves. I, I teach people like bring your master up to maybe like three o'clock on the P16. So you have plenty of headroom to work with zero, everything else. And now start bringing it in and you're going to have so much more headroom to work with, with what you actually want to hear. And of course, pan things, EQ things a little bit. Um, Steven says, talk to them. Communication is essential. Uh, Nathan recommended signals to noise podcast. Um, lots of tips on there. Um, this one's funny. Ivan just boost 10 decibels of 2.5 K on every mix. That'll <laughs> fix it. Um, there was one here. Eric talked about compression. Um, and this, this is a tip where I kind of agree with it, but I kind of don't keep compression to a minimum on vocals. So I don't know about you guys, but I guess as someone who mixes and as someone who sings a lot, I really like compression on my vocals in my ears. Sometimes aggressively so because i feel like compression allows me to sing softer but still hear myself because of that makeup gain happening and then i can like stay on pitch better um especially when i'm just not like singing like full voice or whatever and i'm trying to sing like softer verses um and he made someone made a point down here uh in one of these replies that compressors and in, in monitors can cause a singer to tend to over sing uh, an increased vocal fatigue because if your your voice is getting smashed down because it's being compressed so much, you're not going to hear yourself. So you keep, keep singing louder and then you get tired out real quick. I think the trick around this is making sure your attack time on your compression is closer to like 50 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I do so that like I can still hear the attack of my voice as I'm singing, but I'm not, you know, I'm not like I'm not feeling like the compressor is slamming my voice down too quietly. And the other thing too is I make sure I have the appropriate makeup gain on that compressor. Um, it's not like a compressor should be making it so a vocalist completely loses out their voice, right? That's what makeup gain is for. Um, and then I tend to put on the group level of vocals, I'll put a faster compressor to glue the vocals together. But you don't hear that compression in the main mix. They they'll only hear the channel compression. So. I've been talking for a while. There's so many great tips here. If you guys see any other ones you want to highlight, let me know. But I want to hear what you guys uh, have to think. So what are your thoughts, Luke? I I think maybe uh, on my end, I'm a little bit less picky because as when I was learning, and I don't know about you guys, but when I was learning to lead worship, I was running on Aviams and they were pre-fader and they were coming from, a, I think it was like a Yamaha console um, and it was just so, I, I feel like it was so raw that like, I just learned how to build a good mix in my ear with just a pre fader mix and like put stuff where I wanted it. Um, and so I, I, when I get into these situations where people are, uh, really bougie about their inner mix, I'm, I'm so intrigued as to like how they got there. Cause I'm like, man, we all started from, you know, so I, I feel like we've all come through that journey of really having no pizzazz, no fluff with your in your mix. And now you have all these options, tap points, and you can put a ton of stuff in your ears that kind of can, again, complicate things for people, especially for volunteers. <laughs> like, I think if it's different, if you're, you have a dedicated monitor engineer or you're at a church with, you know, really nice equipment that can kind of uh, allow you some of these luxuries, but for volunteers running a P16 or, you know, even if they're, even if they're just building a wedge mix on stage, I'm like, I zero that thing out every time. You know, I, I think that's the most helpful thing to do is just to start from scratch every time. And it'll take, you know, maybe five minutes to dial in your in-ears. But I think over time, if they get used to building the mix, then, you know, they'll get faster at it and they'll kind of learn where they like things. But I'm sure you guys have seen the volunteers who just, they crank everything uh, or they crank like themselves and one other channel. And I think if you're like just listening to your vocal screaming hot in your ear and maybe piano or guitar screaming hot in your ear and nothing mm -hmm. else, I feel like that'd be more fatiguing for my ears than having a little bit of everything kind of, you know, in, in a well-balanced mix for my ears. So I like the idea of zeroing it out because I think it, it can train people over time but it would re require you to be consistent. 
um, with that. So I know when I run front of house for our church, uh, I, I do run front of house and lead worship quite a bit. And anytime I run front of house, I'll peek into their monitors and like li- queue up their, their ox mix and make small little tweaks like over time. And I always get great feedback on that. Cause they're like, man, I love when you mix because you set my ears up, you know, so nicely and I don't really have to worry about it. Um, but I think it's just because I'm a musician, I kind of know what I would want as a worship leader. So I'm kind of mixing to that end and, uh, making sure there's clarity in there. And so I, I just think if you get good at building a clean mix from scratch, I think you can kind of, I don't know, exercise that muscle pretty easily week in and week out. It wouldn't be as daunting as it sounds to start over. Um, so that's, that's kind of my take on it. Yeah. That's funny. Cause when you were saying about your background of like, I think we're all there. It's funny. Cause I, my background was mixing monitors specifically like monitor mixing with wedges four bands where all I did was have a separate console and they're like, I want more of this and I want more of that. Um, and I want it to be EQ'd this way very specifically. And then after working at the venues and I was doing touring, I was like with a band, you know, the same bands every night. And so they had specific requests about their in-ears and I was always like listening to their in-ear mix. I bought a, a pair of the same, like we all got all, all clairs and I got like the same kind of models as they did. So I could hear their mixes like the same way that they would. Mm. So that's, that's one tip too, is like as a audio engineer, if you can get your own set of in-ears so that you're comparing apples to apples with what the musicians are hearing, that'll help you learn uh, what it is that they're actually hearing through in-ears and not just cans at front of house. Um, But that's, so that's where the bougie came for me, I guess, (laughs) was from that, that touring experience. I think uh, Luke, maybe Luke, you just haven't experienced the bougie of it yet. So that's why you're just, you're just okay with the dry, dry in-ear mixes, right? Which I think you can still function fine. Yeah. I just, well, if, if like, if you are dependent on a bougie in your mix to lead worship or play in a worship band, I think you're setting yourself up for failure. I mean, it just, it's a distraction for your team because everybody's complaining about not having this or that in their ear. And like, and I'm, I'm talking more about those, uh, maybe mid-sized churches that have decent equipment, but they're just not using it well. And they're trying to kind of, I, I would say just like overcomplicate things that probably don't need to be like when you're stepping up to a P16, like I'm, you should be able to build a mix with a P16 and, and be it just fine with that. Like you can, yeah. if you want to mess with tap points and stuff like that on the X32 and, you know, throw some, throw some stuff in there to make that sweeter. I think that's great. But if you can't just like plug in the P16 and get going, uh, then, you know, you're not, I just don't think you're utilizing your tools well, uh, because then it's, if you're, again, if you're complaining about stuff with a P16 kind of unit, then I think you're just, I don't know, setting stuff, people up for failure, uh, the morning of, or during a rehearsal. And so I'm always kind of like, man, I can, if you just give me a click and, and a vocal, like I, man, I'll just lead worship and I don't need to really worry about all the other stuff. You know, it, it can be pretty simple to, to get going. Yeah. So I don't want to overcomplicate, uh, what I need as a leader in that, in that moment. But I've also never mixed with like a dedicated monitor, monitor engineer. So I can't speak to like, if I heard all the nice pieces of the puzzle, um, somebody actively mixing it and, you know, doing group processing and stuff like that for my ears, I, I just have never experienced it. So maybe there's an opportunity for that too. Yeah. I, I think you raise a good point. Like I wouldn't want to be a worship leader who has zero mixing knowledge or understanding, but then, you know, maybe I'm at a larger church. I have a dedicated monitor engineer who does have all that. And he makes my ears sound phenomenal. And then like, you know, next thing you know, maybe I get hired at a new church to be like the lead person. And like, we have P16s and an X32. And I'm like, why do our monitors always sound like trash? <laughs> like, you know, like that's, that would be a tricky place to be to kind of like, it's almost like you get used to driving around the, uh, you know, the, the Lamborghini and then you, uh, get thrown into a Honda Civic or something like that or something s- similar. Yeah. But like, I, to me, the, the reason I just care more about, I, I truly feel it as a worship leader. 
it is so frustrating when I'm, especially because worship leaders, most of us have to be music directors, right? So we need to hear like everything that's going on in the band, yeah. uh, you know, to a decent extent. And as a vocalist and acoustic guitarist, I have feel like maybe I'll make a separate YouTube video about these things. And maybe we can, I can like demo these way, these things in a way that could hopefully come across in a YouTube video. But the, the difference in tone of your voice as you, he monitor yourself uh using the right amount of you know eq and compression you know specifically for your ears i think it also would translate fine at front of house and in in ears yeah. um but then acoustic guitar that's another one i i am pretty aggressive on compression on my acoustic guitar uh, both for front of house and ears just because it's an instrument that when it varies so much in dynamic range we want to bring that variation down so that even if as I'm like leading worship and I'm just finger picking lightly, I want to still feel supported by my finger picking. And then when I'm like strumming uh, to, you know, some chorus, I don't want to blow blast my ears away. Right. right. So, um, and then again, I think there's things that you can do. Uh, you get the channel processing, right? So in ears sound great. The house mix sounds great, but then at the house mix, we can have another layer of control with our bus processing on some of those channels that can make it a bit different. In the front of house, it sounds good that you wouldn't want to do for someone's in ears. Um, so that that kind of just occurred to me now as we're as we're jamming um, on this topic. People could so, people could walk away really uh, with some improvement just by printing out these six steps that James typed in yep. here. Like if you just made this your SOP for the morning for setting your in ears up you'd be in great shape. Yeah. Well, and the things that Jake was just talking about, James actually covers. I just watched his video yesterday about um, like specific tap points and how, you know, you don't want any pitch correction or certain EQs or compression going to ears. And that's why the mixing blueprint method we recommend of channel to bus to matrix to your outputs is beneficial even in this scenario right yeah. like where you can do the extra compression and eq just for the house and it doesn't affect any or so yeah check out james channel for for that video too yeah jake did you switch your camera oh there you are it, uh sorry oh. about that <laughs> we, uh, my mac was like i don't want your cam link i just want your facetime camera yeah. so oh, we'll just roll it. yeah back to the fancy Sony. Um, the last top couple tips I have on in-ear monitors, and I'm speaking from experience, headaches I dealt with, and it was very simple things that I finally realized what was happening was like um, stage volume is such an important deal. Like if you have a lead vocalist next to the drum set and they're like, man, I can't, all I hear is drums in my ears and uh, I have the drums turned down in my mix. It's, it's because it's going through their vocal channel. <laughs> so yeah. like you get, some of these things you got to address, like, and, and that's why it's important to have, like, you know, get drum shield, get electric drums, get better treatment on your stage, because some of these problems will just never go away until you, you, you figure out the fundamental issue there. And then, like, the other tip is, is about the crowd mics thing. Make sure, make sure people are careful with how much crowd mics they introduce into the mix, because that can really create a really noisy mix in in ears, and especially if your crowd mics aren't, like, EQ'd properly. Um, so just beware of adding too much crowd mics into a mix. Um, but yeah, well, any other thoughts on that guys, before we move on to the next topic? Let's go. Okay. This next topic I am very excited about. Um, so we actually launched, um, uh, launching a new company called altitude led systems, and it is what it sounds like led screen systems for the church. So you guys can learn more at altitudeled.com. And we launched a new YouTube channel for Altitude LED. And you guys can check that out here on YouTube. And I'm really excited about this video we made about church stage design using artificial intelligence. Um, so Aaron and I, we're here at South Fellowship Church. We have a Altitude LED wall set up. And he tells the whole story of this, L this look that's currently on the LED wall. People at our church thought this was real stained glass and real pillars that we have built here. And I remember when I saw this, it was like during um, uh, Advent a couple months ago, Advent of 2023. And I was like, wow, that's a really cool image. I, I didn't really ask Aaron. Like, I thought he just found stock photography image of this stained glass background. 
And it wasn't until like a few weeks later, I think it was even like, yeah, it was, yeah, it was like close to Christmas time. Um, he's like, oh, that's, that's AI generated. And I'm like, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> he's like, I use mid journey and you can see here, we walk through the whole process in mid journey to create AI images for backgrounds. And in my opinion, this is like going to be such a game changer for content creation for churches, not only for like LED wall backgrounds, but if you're trying to make like sermon illustration photos and things like that, uh, there's just so much you can do. Um, and for us at our church, this was like, this is what sold the LED wall to the, uh, the board at our church is seeing how it could do these types of things where it's like, we're not getting an LED wall to like have a flashy show, right? You can put a lot of cool graphics on there. Um, I really like the Sunday screens content you can throw up on there. Um, you can throw whatever content, but like to me, the LED wall truly is a stage design piece. And even if you, if you use AI uh, to, to create a convincing image and you blend it with your lighting design at your church, like see how these backlights kind of have that orange glow. It looks like the pillars are like glowing from our backlights. Right. So that's what right. makes uh, tricks the mind into seeing that. Um, t this was just, this blew my mind. So it's kind of been cool to see people's reactions to this. Um, it was shared a short on Instagram about it too, but you guys can check out the full video on the altitude led, uh, channel. So uh, what, what do you guys think? I think that the people in uh, worship and tech ministry, one of the skills that they need to acquire soon is leveraging and learning how to prompt AI to help you in your role. Like it's, it's becoming one of those things that it doesn't make sense to ignore this kind of a tool, because if, if you can, you know, improve your prompts and improve kind of your communication with these AI bots and things, such incredible work comes from it, right? Like Aaron, and we watched the video, Aaron talks about how, how much he refined what AI was giving him by just continuing to feed it better prompts and better prompts, but like the pillars and the kind of the shadows that they create, like that's from his, you know, extra work in prompting it more and more, as opposed to just the first image that he had, had it spit out is, is not really where that final image ended up. So I think, you know, you can, you can really leverage this, this tool, but you've got to spend time with it. But my thing is like, man, it would cost you like, if you add up the dollars, Sunday screens or church motion graphics or any of these other kind of platforms that make backgrounds for churches. I mean, I'm not saying you shouldn't subscribe to those platforms, but you can pay for these AI bots to help you do the same thing. And it's maybe even a little bit more customizable. You could get something that fits your church, uh, you know, stage design better than maybe what you're getting from some of these subscription platforms. So, um, yeah, really, mm -hmm. really cool tool, but you gotta, you gotta spend some time in it to get it, to do it, do what you want, uh, for, for your church. Yeah. Yeah. This is, uh, like I said, before we started recording, um, the drummer at my church saw this video and he's like, man, this is cool. This is like a good argument for why an led wall is more than just, you know, a screen mm -hmm. as part of your, your stage design. And Aaron specifically at this church, like had, had like those triangular things where you could like spin it and use different stage designs. Um, and so now this just one wall stays up all the time and you just change what you feed it so much more efficient for adjusting the look and feel of your stage. Well, yeah, cause yeah, there is used to do the, the, the wood on one side of those panels and then you would turn it around to be a projector. And so you'd have to like, you yeah. had that. Oh, there's the wood panels. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, we did. It was wood panels on one side. And like, again, I think the, these panels look like they're huge pieces of lumber, but it's like, man, it, it, it is still very convincing. And a lot of it, I think is the trick of it is like, how do you, when you're designing these images, how do you, uh, consider just the light, like the environmental light on the stage, like how would it actually, um, impact this wall of wood if that wall of wood was actually there. Right. Um, and, and then the other thing too, it's like, he, he, he created these complementary stained glass designs for the side screens. So this isn't just for LED walls either. You can also 
create AI imagery for your projection screens to maybe complement what's going on your uh, your center screen. It's incredibly powerful. He showed these are like some sermon illustration photos. You can see his whole library here. So the tool is Midjourney, and you use Midjourney and Discord to talk to one another. So um, I don't want to belabor the point. Yeah, like again, this. I'll, you guys have pretty much seen the whole video now that you watch this, but like <laughs> and this image, yeah. And maybe you're not listening to this. You're listening to this on the podcast. It's like you know, a Christmas event happening in our sanctuary from the women's ministry, and they're like, "Hey, could we just have like an image?" where it looks like a snowy scene, like you're looking out a window where there's Christmas trees inside, but outside it's kind of like a snowy valley. And like Aaron's like, yeah, sure. And he just types it into mid journey and then boom, you have this beautiful image. <laughs> um, they had Christmas trees on the stage too. So like the, it just made it even mm. look more real and it looks like on a valley. I'll say so cool. to, for Aaron too, he specifically is a very creative person. And I remember one of the first services I went to at South was a, uh, um, a Good Friday service, right? And it was very creative, like different scenes, like people acting out the different things that happened that night. And I can just imagine how powerful it would be to be able to use that backdrop and image in a story like that to tell that type of story with that imagery ah man that'd be cool yep love it yep so that's it guys uh check out check out that altitudeled.com if you guys want to quote on a led system for your church and then uh our goal too with our channel more importantly subscribe to the youtube channel because we're gonna i've got lots of content lined up there planned out to like help with the visual side creative side of of worship and stage design and, and how you use content so that wraps up that section. Uh, let's move on to some updates from Waves. Those guys are coming out with new stuff, both hardware and software. Yeah. More Here we have the Fourier. Oh, sorry, not Fourier. We have the Super <laughs> Rack Live Box. I'm just kidding. I love you guys at Waves. This is just uh, interestingly timed after the, the Fourier. But uh, the cool thing about this is that it runs Super Rack Performer. So I have Super Rack Performer on my laptop, use it every Sunday that I'm mixing. Uh, even this last Sunday when I played drums, I had the mix engineer use my laptop to run it because I just love running the Waves plugins. But this really simplifies the workflow. Um, there's not a ton of information on here. Like there's not even a photo of the back. Uh, it's probably because it's just like a single Dante or Matty input and a power jack is probably what's on the back of here because you just plug in Dante or Matty and then you run this probably just a PC computer that is optimized for running Super Rack Performer. Um, there's, okay, there's probably also an HDMI and a USB so you can run a touchscreen. Um, but yeah, like it says, like running natively on turnkey to you rack. Like I imagine buying this, plugging in power, Dante, and a computer screen, and then you're just like running all of the the external plugins from your existing console. And so a good example of this is we run an SQ5 at my church and we have a Dante card for it. There's only one IO slot on an SQ5. So I can't run a Waves card at the same time. But because I'm using a Dante, I can run Dante out to the Super Rack live box and then back into my console and use the power of this processor because I can use a laptop, but this is dedicated power optimized for running Super Rack. So the cool thing is you can run not just Waves, but any VST3 plugins with this. Uh, it says it has dual, like redundant power supply. So, you know, if you have two different uh, power racks that you can plug it into that have a different circuit or something, you can have redundant power, which is cool. Um, but yeah, and then the low latency, I'm sure they're able to optimize the low latency compared to just using a MacBook. So I'm excited for this. I think that this is going to be a good solution for a lot of people in our program that are doing something like just a um, like a Behringer or a uh, SQ or Wing, just a different console that only has a single card slot. But what do you guys think? I like the idea that it's, it reduces the amount of gear that you need to get into the ecosystem, right? I mean, it, you know, 
right now, like let's do the comparison of what we just did, even at a previous install we did with an Avantis and they wanted the Wave Super Rack install. So you had to get a host computer, the server, the network switch, like, and, and you had to get an IO card for the Avantis. So, I mean, that takes those two computers and it, it's going to be the same uh, rack size, basically. Like this is mm -hmm. essentially those two units just smashed together into one piece. But I mean, it just simplifies it. Less cable, less equipment uh, overall, less like other pieces that could, uh, you know, points of failure, if you will. Um, so I, I love that it just kind of, it's just one go-to spot. And I like that it's a super rack uh, program running on it. You know, they didn't, like they could have, I think it might've been tempting to like release a different app to run on this, but super rack is so good and it's so fun and reliable that, like, I love that they said, okay, we're going to just put Super Rack on this puppy and call it a day. So I'm excited about it. Yeah. You know what? You know what I think is even cooler than this Super Rack live box? It's the new iPad app for LV1 that they just updated, the Mix Mirror. So now I actually, I'm excited because I'm about to get set up the LV1 at, at Rock Harbor here in a couple weeks, but I, uh, I didn't really know how limiting the LV1 iPad app kind of was before with just like kind of simple like channel fader and mute and just basic settings. You couldn't even really dive into plugin settings with the iPad app. So this yeah. is going to be great. This only caveat to this is if you are running a Mac for your LV1 system, this iPad app does not work right now. Mm. So it only works if you have an Axis uh, host computer, which is very weird to me like ultimately when i'm thinking about like you're you built an ipad app and i think with all the kind of apple silicon stuff out there like merging apps from a mac to an ipad is like super easy but uh yeah right now you can only run this app if you're running a, an access host computer so i would imagine that they would update that in the future but um but yeah this is this is one of the pieces that like really you need uh, for your LV one, because if you, like Jake said, if you don't have this app, you're, if you're walking around the room and you're trying to mix, you've got to, that my front of house app is really just faders. It's not, you can't jump into anything. So you'd have to go all the way back to wherever your console is to get, you know, plug in control, uh, to, to mix the room or whatnot. But my one ask with waves, like in the future, if, if they ever listen to this would be, couldn't we just merge the two apps on the iPad and have the, my front of house app be able to do the mix mirror functionality so that we don't have to go back and forth between the two apps. Cause this, this is not fader control. So this is just, Oh, I didn't even know control. that. Yeah. It's just I'll take a, back my excitement. <laughs> it's just a plugin <laughs> control on the iPad, which is super helpful but then you've got to move over to the my front of house app and then you've got faders back. So it just feels so, like why, why do we have to separate them? Why do we have to make two apps? But I'm not a plugin developer. Uh, or I'm not an app developer. So I don't know. Yeah. And you guys, you have, didn't you run the newer iPad with both of these apps on your last site visit? No, we didn't. Well, I didn't use the mix mirror. It came out right as we were finishing or leaving. So, uh, yeah. I didn't use it there, but was, we used the my front of like, house one at the Glenwood Springs deployment. Yeah, because like my my computer setup now, I have the touch screen that we sold to to all those clients, and if I want to switch between applications, I'll just come up to my screen, three fingers, and swipe across. So yeah. is that not the same experience with the iPad? Well, yeah, you can. Like that's iPads can do multitasking, so you can just run both apps essentially at the same time, and you know go back and forth between the two. Um, that's a that's a pretty seamless experience. I just, yeah, I'm like, you know, in like let's talk about the Allen and Heath iPad app, or even the the Wing iPad app. You can at least get into the compression and EQ, and you know you can make tweaks and adjustments there. Um, so I I just. Yeah, I, don't know. I think it makes sense. Like, why wouldn't, yeah, why wouldn't you be able to merge those two? Maybe that's, I hope that's something that they do. Yeah. Sorry to burst your bubble. Yeah, they'll do it. Jake. I, I like, you know, <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I, but the thing is, I, I've, we've known Waves long enough now where I think they're just like, hey, we have this capability. Let's just ship it and get it out there, get into yeah. users' hands and, and get, and then like, let's spend a decade developing this perfectly and then, 
when a decade arrives now everybody wants to use something else anyway <laughs> so that's, yeah, where, that's like true. some some in- take that i'd rather have the like not complete products just shipped so we can start using them instead of the opposite so uh okay this next thing i want to talk about and we don't have to spend too much time but i some someone um oh it's funny him go the url not looking up the actual loot fit where is why is the <laughs> url not going here Ludafisk. Uh, why is it not yeah it's not bringing you anywhere it's this thing called Loot Fish. I literally had it. I have it on my screen if you want to pull it up. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's go to Adam's screen. I don't know why it's not. Okay, so maybe I was spelling it wrong or didn't get the URL on the right. But anyhow, this is kind of cool. This showed up. Things like show up in my inbox are messages. I don't know where they come from. I get so many emails all the time. But I don't read half of them because half of them are kind of just... This one was like, oh, this is kind of cool. It's like this rem- remote re- like rehearse with your band idea. Um, and you know, in worship, we're always rehearsing with bands every week. So it could be an interesting fit concept guys. I've spent zero time diving into this, learning about it. I did not sign up for it. I'm just throwing it out there of something like, Oh, it might be worth looking into. Um, if you need some sort of remote rehearsal setup. So that's really all yep. I want to say about it. I want to tell you guys about church front conference. So I will get that pulled up here for you. We have a new landing page for it at churchfront.com forward slash conference. And uh, 2024, October 1 through 2. So we're holding it uh, again at South Fellowship Church. Our capacity is only about 400 people. So I would sign up soon. And if you sign up for the conference before the end of this month, uh, February. So if you sign up for March 1st, you can get up to 40% off. Use the early bird discount code. And I'm excited. Uh, the more that we host conferences, I feel like the better we get at it. So it's going to be more and more fun every year we do it. Uh, the speaker lineup is great. I actually have a few people I need to add to it, but a few people to highlight. Chad Vegas, Drew Brashler, uh, Christian Ponsford, Ben Haley, Zach Hicks, um, a couple more people too. I can't even remember the names off my... Oh, uh, no, he didn't confirm yet. I, I got to work. wait on confirming people before Stay we tuned. actually... Get it, get it up here. But yeah, go check it out and uh, hope to see you guys at Churchfront Conference 2024. Next topic. So ideas for sketching out your AVL integration designs. This is something that we've been doing a lot here at Churchfront recently because we're doing a lot of client work. We're getting out there designing things for churches. And it's kind of fun because we're evolving as a integration service company and you guys get to watch that process happen. So let's talk about some of the options and kind of how we're finding the limitations of some of these more basic ones. We're probably going to kind of up our game to some more advanced ones here soon. And a lot of people, they've been seeing the videos with our sketches and asking like, what is this? What's the software you guys are using? So uh, I want to let uh, you, how about you, Adam, uh, to the software here that we get pulled up and um, how it's been working, pros and cons, and kind of what we're thinking of. Yeah, I think that if I remember right, Luke found this through the system engineer that we generally hire out for uh, audio designs, uh, Michael Curtis, who's also great, who uh, is, I don't know if he is on our webpage for Churchfront 2024, but I'm pretty sure he's going to be there. Um, So this... Uh, Maybe, yeah, actually, actually, we never talked... Do we? Do you guys want Michael Curtis back again at 2024 Churchfront? Let us know in the comments. I will. Uh, <laughs> I'm asking the. Audience. Yep. Yeah. So this is a really helpful tool just to visualize. What I really like about it is that it is actually nice to look at. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's one thing that uh, the more complicated systems like they just don't look as good. Um, but we're able to like pull in graphics here and specifically say like, here's a Dante card. Uh, That's the other thing, you can zoom in and out and the quality is there. So it's like, okay, this wire, we're gonna have it be a specific color. We name what kind of cable it's going to, it's going to a network switch. So we pull in all of these different components and then we make sure that every wire is there. And that really helps us cut down on when we're arriving and realizing, ah, we missed having this cable or that cable or this type of connection is not going to work or we forgot to have them order this, you know, specific converter. 
drawing it out really helps make sure that when we arrive on site that everything's going to be there. So this is for Donald. I'm excited in a few weeks to to visit his church and we're going to deploy this. But yeah, it's really as simple as pulling in graphics and then using tools like connectors to say, I want to connect this network switch port over to this piece of gear and then dropping that in. And you can change the color, you can change, add text to it, all of that. And then when you move them, all of the cables stay connected. So this oh, is a really cool. handy tool. Nice. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty simple. And it's free when you like when you sign up just as a user, you know, I think you've got a limitation on how many projects you can do maybe, but it's, uh, I mean, it's a free browser based tool. So it's, you know, for somebody just sketching out their own tech equipment at their church, like this is a great solution. Yeah, and there was one that you had done uh, with coaching. So like um, Michelle, we were on some calls with this morning, like she was able to even use the sticky note feature of this or the comment feature to kind of ask specific questions. Like yep. she's like, hey, is this the Mac mini? And Luke Sable say, yep, that's what that's going to. So uh, you can even communicate through this. And I think just in general, anytime you can attach a conversation to an action step, that really helps streamline the workflow like we've been using asana as one of our tools and doing that for projects and being able to attach the conversation to the action step instead of separating that in a different platform uh that workflow is so much more frictionless yeah yeah i love i love whimsical for what it is it's uh you know it's so again it's aesthetically pleasing it's so easy like all you have to do is copy and paste images from google right into this thing so we've We've got a running folder of, you know, the library of images we've been using so we can just drag and drop them or, you know, again, copy and paste right from our browser window on our computers uh, into these designs. And then as we add things, we can kind of save templates and things like that. But this is this is great for system design. It's also good for just coaching calls. And we've uh, a lot of times just to visualize what's going on on a coaching call and what an issue might be. We can just, Hey, what kind of gear are we talking about? Let's throw that into whimsical. Okay. Walk me through the signal path. Walk me through the flow. Where is, where are things getting broken or what could be the points of failure there? Uh, so it's been super helpful to have just as a easy resource to pull up it's web-based. So it's everybody can see the, you know, we don't have like permission settings we have to deal with here. It's, you know, really easily accessible for uh, the folks we're working with. Very yep. nice. So if you guys want that uh, VIP experience to get your own whimsical designs designed by yours truly, Luke and Adam, and um, yeah, our coaching team, which are the two of them right now, it's growing. We got Matt. Maybe Matt will start doing some designs too soon. Um, but definitely check out the Church Front Accelerator program where we'll coach you, consult you, you get courses, and then we'll help you uh, design and deploy your systems. So, oh yeah, do you even get this one? I forgot that we had to mention this. Yep. So we also have uh, Vectorworks that we literally just signed up for. I don't think any of us have like started any projects, have anything to share with it yet. But uh, this is what we're going to be using uh, a few times as ConnectCAD software. Um, so you can check out their website. But yeah, if there are any other tools that you guys use, we would love to hear about them and uh, check them out as well. Okay, so I have yeah. to say one thing about ConnectCAD that I think the audience would benefit from is ConnectCAD, if you, again, then this is like a professional tool that, you know, integration companies and uh, builders and stuff will use when they're building properties, building infrastructure, but I don't, so I don't think everybody needs it. But one of the features that is crazy to me is that once you build out your, uh, wiring diagram here that you can see ConnectCAD has a feature where you run a wire test and it will, it will check your whole design point of connection inputs and outputs and tell you if you have miswired something. So if you've, you know, put an HDMI cable where it should have been an SDI cable or, you know, so so that the inputs on your gear and the outputs on your gear are actually talking to the right kind of connector and cable. And so I just think it's like, man, software is so cool that, you know, you could design something, 
run a test on it and see if you know you've missed anything or if you've forgotten something if there's a an open loop somewhere where you know maybe you didn't attach the other end it'll tell you that kind of stuff too so really excited to dive into this and we'll i'm sure we'll be doing some highlights as we uh, start using it on projects too yeah i i could see a day where we have someone who full-time that's all they do is is work in software like this make really nice clean diagrams i vector work seems a great middle ground between something as simple as whimsical but then something as advanced as like d tools which i think more of the traditional integration companies have used and you look at a d tool sketch and it's like it's just, oh my gosh, I mean, yeah. my life would be miserable if I had to look at those all day long. So it's just like, yeah. I know it's like, maybe I'm just a fussy millennial who likes design, but I just like the vector work seems like they get the, the world between like what actually looks good and is pleasant to look at and what actually gets all the data uh, that we, you need uh, for schematics like this. So I'm excited to to dive into sp specifically ConnectCAD here. And then there's, I saw Vectorworks has a whole suite of like architectural 3d rendering things it's just it's really yeah. crazy so what, my, what are the, my, oh go ahead i was just saying my word of advice to like you uh, young and upcoming guys looking for like practical skills to develop that are going to be marketable skills i would learn how to use software like this because mm -hmm. it, it could be i mean they have a whole like university worth of courses on this type of software and um that's just man it, to me that's way more practical than going getting a psychology degree somewhere yeah one of the other things that a church might benefit from something like this for that i think we would encourage is uh once you put your design into place you essentially can just have the software make you a label sheet and it will because it labels things as you go and then it can spit out a label sheet as a you know a pdf or an excel sheet or whatnot that you can then just essentially print your labels from um, so you can Whoa. load that into your label maker and then you can spit out your labels and it just makes it for you. So if you don't have labeled cables and you want labeled cables, but you don't want to like go through the kind of, you know, maybe the uh, poor man's version of doing it, you could use a tool like this to just put all of your gear into a schematic, plug it all in, make sure that it, you know, the wiring test goes well, and then it will create your labels for you uh, in all those sequential orders, nice, you know, nice naming schemes. So, uh, and then you would just print them off and, and start, you know, putting them on your cables. So could streamline the process a little bit if you, if you learn how to use a tool like this. So really excited about it. Geek out on it all day. Very nice. Were there any other drawing tools we wanted to mention here? Was that about it? There's, and I mean, Google Draw. I mean, there's probably some other, I think I've noticed yeah. in some of the groups, some other free options out there too. You don't have to pay for this type of software, but when you're, we're, we're learning as we're starting to scale out, we're doing a lot of projects. We're using uh, Asana has been a great project management software we're using with clients. Um, just a lot of things to get done, a lot of designs to get drawn and, and then implemented. So uh, next thing, Speaking of integration, I have this little catapult rack here that I pulled up from Radial. This is a newer product. Uh, these catapults are cool because you can send a few channels of audio over Cat5. Um, and before they had the smaller catapults, um, but here we've got these cool like uh, rack mount versions. So now you can get like up to 12 channels. Sender received 12 channels of analog audio over standard Cat5 or Cat6. Um, so I'm kind of excited about this as I'm thinking about the Rock Harbor stage design. I was originally going to do some like analog, um, stage floor pockets, but I'm like, well, is it, could it, could I implement some of these instead, um, and have maybe a, uh, catapult, uh, receiver on one end, uh, this, one of these rack mounted things rack, like in the rack backstage. But then I could. Uh, this is compatible with the other smaller, smaller like four-channel catapult devices that I could put as kind of my quote floor pockets um, on the stage itself to make it, you know, put it right next to where instruments or backline musicians would be. So I thought this is a cool product. It's not even. I don't even know if you can buy it yet, but Radial they just released it a couple weeks ago. Because it was just Nam, right? And it, we we just got yeah. out of the Nam, so everybody's kind of dripping dripping some new products that I'm sure we'll be hearing about. This is cool. I like how clean it is. Yeah. Yeah. You guys um, know um, our our sales guy who's not on the church front show. His name's Eric. He's a drummer of a band. Um, I did sound for his band once, and the rehearsal spot that we used was a church in Denver. 
and they had utilized something like this where all of their connections on stage were those little catapults. So we were rewiring the stage for rehearsal and it was like, instead of having a bunch of snake heads, they just had those catapults. So it was like, you know, catapult one, a through D or whatever, or catapult a one through four, um, was what you actually plugged all the cables into. And it was pretty slick. Very cool. Yeah. Well, that, that kind of helps further, um, justify my thinking there of, of what I want to do at rock Harbor. Um, I do want to mention while we're on the topic of prime acoustic radio, they're, they're the same company. We're dealers for prime acoustic. Um, Adam and I spent some time talking through these ecoscape solutions for a client. Um, and that's going to be cool because the ecoscapes effectively produce the same result as the panels, but they can just look a lot better. So they're a little bit more work to actually get installed, but it, you know, you can see here, this, this install here, they did a fancy design. Um, let's see, like, this is like in somebody's office. Um, oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah, this is like so a dope. church set up here. But what's nice, nice about the ecoscapes, we'll probably need them at Rock Harbor too, is like, you can just do so much more because all it is is like, basically, you know, you have these metal tracks that kind of make up the shape. And then you like, you get the, the Broadway raw material panel goes in it, usually two inch, I believe. And then you, you kind of cut that to shape of whatever the space you need or the design you're using. And then you cover it with the fabric. So we're going to be deploying that um soon at the same uh church that adam was just talking about so i guess they come with wall panels the cloud versions and baffles as well so let us know if you guys have need any uh acoustic solutions that's another uh stage design idea too if you're thinking about how to leverage your stage mm -hmm. and design it well if you're maybe you're not doing an led wall but maybe you should you leverage something like ecoscapes because the other piece about the prime acoustics is you can put images or paint these panels uh to basically fit your your brand you know so if you had yeah. if you were really looking for some stages on ideas you could put panels on your stage and leverage the acoustic benefits from that um while still yep. making something aesthetically pleasing yep yeah and don't forget about other applications too outside your worship center whether the lobby maybe your fellowship hall is super noisy mm -hmm. and loud people can't hear each other talking this is the type of thing that you want to use because again aesthetically it looks really cool he even showed me a couple they have like these like it looks like wood you could like hang these like wood beams that kind of have a absorption cloud effect to them uh, lots lots of cool products here so yeah um moving on Got to find my little document that tells me what I've got going on here. Okay, up next. Uh, oh, I want to give a shout out to our accelerator program. Uh, of course, we've been talking about that already quite a bit today. Um, but if you guys go to churchfront.com and go to the apply to join, um, you know, what we're doing, it, we're, we're really kind of, our program has evolved a lot over the past few years. We first kind of just did courses. Then we added a lot of this coaching onto it, and now we're actually doing the integration. So if you guys, if your church has any type of uh, upgrade coming up, like let us know, apply for the program. Um, and I think, you know, it's interesting to reflect, guys, on the differences of like what how we work versus like an integrator, um, especially as I'm learning more about the integration world and how it kind of, it just doesn't make a lot of sense, if I'm, if I'm honest, because like, we kind of take the approach of like, hey, partner with us so our team can really get to know your worship and production ministry, your team, your goals, all those things. And we can kind of get into the micro integration aspects of like down to like what software, what instruments, what tools are you going to be using on a weekly basis? And then when it comes to thinking through like the bigger picture integration stuff, whether you're doing a big sound upgrade or lighting upgrade or LED wall, that all like fits into the context of who you are instead of us being like, oh yeah, you want to bid on a PA or LED wall or lights? Like, here you go. Here's a bid. It's X amount of dollars and 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 that, that's how much it's gonna cost you, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like here's the invoice. It's like, it's like, okay, like I just feel like we kind of it's almost like we're the backwards integration company in a way. Um, because part of why why we do that too is like we can save you. 
I think a lot of integration headache by engaging in the coaching program first to be like, okay, let's look at what you already have. Um, I do think integration is probably a little bit more straightforward when it's like a brand new building situation. Most of our clients are like, we've got an existing building, we've got some gear we want to keep and want to use. Um, and I think it's a lot just better stewardship when we dive into the weeds with your situation, um, where you're at now. So then we can really help you determine like, okay, yes, continue to use this tool or strategy or no, you should, you know, there's something better. It's totally worth, uh, investing into, and we can kind of guide you through that process. So, yeah, we've seen a, a lot of our churches are kind of, uh, I, I don't want to paint the bad picture, but like we, we see them come out and they're like, we had an integrator come in and give us all this stuff and we don't know how to use it, you know, and, and the integration, the integration company has moved on to the next job. Cause it, it's, you know, they got to continue to sell the gear and uh, move the equipment and stuff like that. But they're not, they're not providing that ongoing support or that ongoing training and that ongoing resourcing. So I think that's where we've kind of, uh, we've seen a lot of growth in the church leaders that we're working with and they're learning new skills. They're applying new strategies because they're, they're in the accelerator program where we're working hands-on and remotely with them to get their skills kind of increased as well, not just deliver on a bid, you know? And so it's, it's even adding a whole nother level of, uh, support and partnership to that experience. You're yes, you might be getting an upgrade or a, a new, new system or whatever you might be doing there, but you're also getting the skills that will be required to actually leverage that tool correctly. Yep. And the know-how of like, when we propose a design, you understand it. Like, yeah. it's not like, a lot of integrators will hand over design and people are looking at that and be like, what, what does all this stuff mean? What does it do? What's it for? And it, when you understand it, then it's just a much more productive design process to go back and forth with an integ integrator to really hone in on what, what your team needs. Right. So yeah. yeah, it's been a fun journey. So check it out, go to churchfront.com. You can check out the case studies that we got there. Uh, of course we we feature them here on the YouTube channel as well. Um, up next, uh, Adam, we've got some new stuff from Midas. Yeah. So this year, there's no product page for it. <laughs> so I guess we just have to shocking to find um, some Instagram posts or something. But um, there's this Heritage D96 Air. So this is what you're seeing right here is this little shot. Uh, it's just this with some faders. So the big boy is here, which is the touch screen with all the faders and the extra buttons and all of that. But the small version is basically a lap, a folding laptop version of the left half. Okay. You can picture that, but, uh, it's interesting. I mean, I don't know last time, maybe you guys know last time something came from Midas. Uh, as far as a product goes, I mean, this looks very, this looks like the Pro 2 grow, grew up a little bit, came a little more sophisticated. Um, after watching some videos, I actually think it took quite a few notes from from some Digico friends, uh, as far as the UI, the font and stuff like that interaction mm -hmm. goes. But uh, I did utilize the Sweetwater page to look under the hood a little bit, watch this video. This one caught my eye. Midas Heritage D AI. So just some highlights from this video. You can go check it out. But uh, auto naming channels, like let signal come through, and it's like, I think this is a bass guitar, or I think this is an electric guitar. And then if it's wow. right, you can click that, and it'll name what? the channel. That's Seriously? pretty sweet. Uh, also, when you do that, it says bass guitar. Let's see, bass guitar, you probably want the low-pass filter set at 40, you might want a high pass filter at 10K. And maybe you want to cut some some mid range from it. Uh, you probably want to have it compressed at you know maybe a, a four to one where it's it's pulling down no 8 way. dB. You want to start with that? Yeah, that's what it looked like from the video. That's, that's gnarly. Cool. So wow. I might be wrong on that, but when I watched the video, that was the impression I got. It was like we think this is a bass guitar. We think that you might want to use start with these EQs and comps, uh, this type, yeah, presets wow. for a bass. Oh, maybe you want to do that. So yeah, 
pretty slick. Um, and then it has this channel tagging and stuff. Um, it also has built-in Wi-Fi. So, um, like, they have the laptop there. It has wireless built-in, so you can use the the show control. Looks like IP-based, um, and you can have these different show files and be able to open them up and copy them over from your cloud-based account. Wow. Um, you also can, I think it'll pull up here in a second, pull in a patching via an Excel sheet. So we use Excel sheets, Google Sheets, to create show files just to plan them out. Uh, but it sounds like you actually can use that spreadsheet to do some some file naming and different things. I think they used a phone to pull that in. That, I mean, yeah. that feature set, holy cow. That's pretty hey, cool. Yep. Luke, it can be all yours for $50,000. <laughs> I Is couldn't find the price. Nice? I think I, I think when I was doing some brief Googling, yeah, I think uh, up, up where it's around the cost Special of a Tesla order. Model 3. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or about, hey, no, Being... it's only it's only about one Bitcoin, actually. Yeah. I, I laugh when you always know it's going to be above a certain threshold when it says special order or call your rep. They don't want to yep. put the num- yep. that big of a number on on the website. So, yeah. Yep. Speak, but, speak I mean, with the console specialist. Yeah. It, I mean, yeah. but goodness gracious. OK, the feature set of if we did if a if consoles in the future did not have to connect locally to a network and you could do wireless show control and, you know, get on the editor wirelessly that would be incredible and i think you know presets and ai helping you patch quickly um i mean churches probably aren't week to week like repatching all of their stage inputs and outputs but i mean i know you know from time to time you got to make an adjustment but just then the setup process would be super helpful so that's that's a really cool feature set i like i like what they've done yeah nice. yeah this is i've never seen this on a console maybe there are plugins that do it but Channel AI listens to your source, tells you what it is, suggests gain EQ comp, and more. That means an, cool. an engine has to be running in there, right? Like they have to have a, some sort of an AI engine inside. I think everybody. I think Graviton, there's, a, MK2. I think there's a loose. I think there's a loose definition of of AI these right. days. Like what's you know is this is like this isn't like Chat GPT AI. No. You know, it's like I don't know anything. Any computer can be kind of considered artificial intelligence, right? But yeah, yeah. so mm-hmm. that's cool. But wake me up when uh, Midas makes their version of like the wing, like a uh, a better like a premium, hardware. Yeah, the premium, premium, the premium wing or something like that. I actually, I wouldn't mind a wing that's like a bigger touchscreen gets rid of that whole upper right section of the of that console, which I literally never touch ever, and then just you know maybe. <laughs> Maybe 16, 16 faders and yep. just like a nice, you know, something nice and clean. Or that similar to, to, to that 96 Air form factor. I kind of like that. Yeah. But The wing um, The winger. We'll call it the winger when it comes out. If it's, the like, winger. The M, if it's like the M32R, it'll be like the, yep. the wing R the wing. winger. <laughs> awesome. I will say this this section of the screen looks way more useful. And holy cow, a 21-inch touchscreen. That that's is huge. That's bigger than a laptop. <laughs> like that is nice. I thought and when you said wake me up, I thought you were gonna say when Sip when Midas runs. Behringer allows allows other people to sell their gear other than Sweetwater. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? It's the, true. Uh, nah. The other it's too it's too rich for my blood to to go go that Midas bougie route, but it, them and Digico, I'm not I'm not there yet. I'm, it's above my it's above my expertise level. Um it's very digico oh, yeah. If you've ever worked above on Digico my, and you above my arrogance level. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh before I get myself into trouble on this YouTube channel like I did in our Facebook group, which people can go check out, Church Run <laughs> Community, lots of fun going on there. Uh the oh, the last thing was that Midas had that new like interface, but honestly, I don't even know if it's worth that covering here. It's just a cool like yeah, it's like AES to yeah AES to USB three, and then you can have like a hundred and some odd channels coming in through this interface. So Huge. if you're in that if you're in that world of Midas and you have the unlimited budget, looks like a cool tool to run like a virtual sound check and to instantly fill up your computer with 192 <laughs> channels worth of uh, 
audio. So, cool stuff, Midas. Very impressed. Um, well, guys, I want to encourage you to visit churchfront.com, your roadmap for worship and production ministry, because Luke, Adam, and I, uh, we only spend about one hour like this or one and a half hours per uh, month doing these fun shows. But the rest of the time, we are working with clients, developing courses, developing our program, and you can join and be a part of that by going to churchfront.com. Uh, let us know what you guys like about the show format today. Um, and yeah, let us know your feedback on the Church Front Show down below in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe, whether you're watching here on YouTube or listening to the podcast. Thanks so much for listening. We appreciate you. Keep up the great work in your ministry, and we'll see you next time.